Welcome to Outrage and Optimism. I'm Tom Rivett Karnak. I'm Cristiana Figueres. And I'm Paul Dickinson. This week, we talk about the geopolitics of energy prices and how this is affecting the transition to a zero carbon world. We speak to the brilliant Adam McKay, director of Don't Look Up, and we have music from Sybil Sailor Arba. Thanks for being here. Okay, so we are back again with another episode, a couple of weeks in, and uh, there seems to be so much going on in the world at the moment. And some of it's good, but much of it is frankly concerning. And I've been looking this week at the energy markets, and there's something so peculiar about energy markets. I do not quite understand these wild price fluctuations. I mean, gas is now nearly six times higher than it was a year ago. Uh, A couple of years ago, we were looking at oil that was sub $10 a barrel. Now we're talking about $100 a barrel oil. Um, There is a whole range of changes in the world around preventing fossil fuel extraction, which of course is something that we should applaud. But as a result of these rising prices, and we can get into why they're rising, we're seeing massive impacts on the geopolitical stage with Russia flexing its muscles and battles going on in Ukraine and arguments over Nord Stream 2. It really feels like this has the potential to create a narrative that could slow down the transition to net zero when most deep analysis actually suggests that the best way we can deal with rising prices is to get to net zero as quickly as possible. So let's start there. Either of you want to kick off with any observations around what is happening at the moment in the global energy markets? Paul, I know you're chomping at the bit. Go for it. (laughs) Paul's classic as the only one who's actually done any research. Dive in, Paul. We're ready to be wowed. Okay, well, I'm going to start off with a bit less wowie, but we'll see if we get to a bit <laughs> more from wowie that. after a while. Okay. I mean, you know, it's been my job to look at this kind of stuff for about 20 years, and I wouldn't say I understand it all that well, which implies to me it is a little bit complicated. I mean, it's kind of weird that when... <laughs> or random. No, it's kind of weird that when oil prices rise, the oil companies' profits go up. Because if you think about it, there's money going to the producers, you know, the oil, typically nations own a lot of the oil uh, in the ground, you know, countries like Saudi Arabia and Russia. Um, And then when the price rises, the oil company's profits go up and not down. So somehow they managed to, you know, pass on increases in the raw material cost to the final output cost. And that's a little bit implies there's a kind of cartel going on, if you see what I mean. Uh, Because in most industries, when a raw materials price increases, the profit margin decreases. Um, So the two things that this can tell us is is that the industry is very good at passing on price increases. That's to say that we find it very hard to substitute for fossil fuels. And secondarily, that that the whole industry operates to some extent uh, as as an organized cartel. Uh, But the, the good news, if, if, if I can be so bold, bold as to suggest there is some good news, uh, and I'm going to draw on a little bit of personal experience here. Eleven years ago with uh, a, a, a somebody called Mitchell, I started my insulation company, Mitchell and & Dickinson. And I can tell you, having spent 11 years trying to insulate houses, the number one barrier to insulation is low energy prices. When energy prices are low, nobody bothers to insulate their houses. And when energy prices are high people go off and insulate their houses. So I think on the one hand, we've got these wild energy fluctuations, and it's probably true that less capital investment in fossil fuel recovery is causing energy prices to rise. But we should also see it as a great stimulus for us to invest in renewable energy. As Christiana says, it never sends you a bill. And to insulate, so we require less energy. That's my quick summary. Nice. From personal experience selling double glazing, I like it. Christiana? Yeah, I was going to say nice <laughs> summary that um, brought to you by Mitchell and Dickens. <laughs> exactly. Thank you very much. Period properties insulation reversible. No I, plan I, commission. I, 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 actually, Paul, I would be interested to know: Has Mitchell and Dickinson seen more demand for its? Double glazing. Yes, hugely. We had our best quarter ever uh, last quarter. It's, it's rocketing. Interesting. Okay. Well, there you go. And the phone number to get insulation <laughs> in your house. No, 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 no. We can't get it. We're already advertising Costa Rica. That's enough. Christiana, what's... <laughs> well, I thought, I thought I would give Paul, you know, a fight. 
a fighting chance. They're actually in conflict. You know, if you insulate your home, it's kind of warm enough to probably stay in the UK. But actually, if you don't you insulate don't your home, it. it's freezing. You've got to go to Costa Rica yeah. to survive. But you don't, you don't want to insulate it so warm that you start growing palm trees, do you? There you go. Well, no, that's but, true. Christian, I'd be interested to know, I mean, Paul's made the point that higher energy prices precipitate a transformation towards investing in insulation, etc. But what we're seeing in the UK, where Paul and I are sitting, is that higher energy prices make net zero targets politically vulnerable. Because politicians, particularly on the right, start saying, oh my God, you know, energy prices are going up. We need to get rid of all these net zero targets with no evidence that the two are connected. So what would you say about that intersection? Because it does seem that rising energy prices on the one hand, an opportunity to invest. On the other, the politics starts to shake a bit. Yeah, I, I think it would be interesting to remember that like in any market, we have a supply side argument and we have a demand side argument. So from the supply side, now in this case, supply of oil and gas, these high prices obviously incentivize any and all oil and gas companies to continue to invest either and or into more extraction or more infrastructure or anything that supports that supply. That is understandable. From a demand side, those of us who use electricity, the high prices actually incentivize us to move away from the dependency of fossil fuels and actually move our purchases of electricity over to renewables because, as we know, they have more predictable and more stable prices. So both of those incentives are at play. They just reflect different sides of the market, whether you're in supply or whether you're into demand. Where the, where the intersection comes is in what I would call the smart supply side, i.e. the more visionary gas, oil and gas companies that understand that these profits, uh, quite, um, quite unexpected profits that they're having now are exactly what they can be harvesting in order to invest into their own transition. Because what we know from the past is that these high prices are with us now, but they do not stabilize there. The, the instability of those fuels is historically true and will continue. Mm. So, um, so this is, you know, this, this is where we are with the big question of the oil and gas companies, which ones of these are actually putting this in to their investment for the transition and which ones are just barreling along, literally barreling along and producing more and more of this stuff of which we don't need. Well, so I don't have a complete answer to that, but today BP announced record profits, um, highest profits in seven years or something, and they're returning a substantial chunk of it to shareholders. So I'm sure there's an argument, and you're right, around long-term thinking and how do they deploy this capital to actually facilitate their transformation. But it's also true that they're not really being responsible because when they get this cash, they distribute it back to shareholders to raise their share price. So, you know, both things are going on there. But I want to ask about one slightly different thing, which is in the midst of all of this gas price crisis with us being so aware, particularly in the EU, of how vulnerable we are to Russian gas and, you know, Putin grandstanding on the world stage, particularly in regard to Ukraine. In the midst of all of this, the European Commission has issued its sustainable finance taxonomy. And included within that is a categorization for gas to regard gas as a green fuel. And as a result of that, gas companies are now looking at raising green debt on the bond markets because they are included in that taxonomy so they can be regarded as a green investment. Now, that feels to me like a place where the geopolitics of energy has massively undermined the resolve and the ability of a major climate leader to actually take meaningful action to deal with the issue. What do we think about that? Who would be the major climate leader in that sentence? The EU. Yeah. I mean, whilst you're thinking, Christiana, if yeah. I can offer up a, just a, like, a, like a couple of thoughts. I mean, the, the first one is that um, it, 
you know, the, the, there's a lot of energy is used uh, to heat our homes, for example. In the UK, peak heat is, and this is industry as well, peak heat is four times the output of the electricity grid. So the thing about gas is it provides like this phenomenal amount of uh, energy, uh, you know, kind of as and when you need it. And it's not that incredibly easy to store very large amounts of gas. So supply and demand can have these sort of uh, exaggerated impacts. But I would say that is a really, really good case actually for us to invest in uh, renewables and storage and also perhaps nuclear, which was part of this taxonomy in the EU that's been very, very controversial. Um, but I, but, I, but I, I do think, I thought about this for a while and to be honest, I think if gas is specifically replacing coal, that's to say if gas recovery is hypothecated uh, to replacing coal, you can kind of see a logic for it. But actually, I personally wouldn't classify the fossil fuel gas as a, as a transition fuel if it's not replacing coal, because if we build that renewable energy infrastructure and the storage, even though it's huge, or if we use nuclear, which is we can talk about, then you're not making climate change worse. Well, can I push back against that, Paul? Because, um, you know, this, this thing about gas being a transition, it's, it is a transition, but the more important thing is for how many years? So when we think about, um, when, as you're saying, using, moving from coal to gas, okay, that's an improvement. The problem is if you then invest into so much extraction and infrastructure for gas, that then there is a built-in incentive to maintain that infrastructure yep, yep, going. Yep, for decades. Way, for decades, way beyond what the natural, let me say, or the societal, or in fact, even the economic expiration date would have been for gas. So we're actually artificially extending that expiration date. And that's the danger. It's not about arguing, is it or is it not a transition gas? It's about trying to figure out, it's a trans, it's, how long is that bridge? Is it a two, three year bridge? Okay, maybe acceptable. It certainly cannot be a 20 or 30 year bridge. Yeah. I mean, Christiane, if I can just say, I have my principles and if you don't like them, I have other principles, actually. I agree with you. Yeah, no, sure. I, we shouldn't lock in this long-term stuff. You're right. Um, this is very interesting. And, and just one further thought on it. I mean, we all remember at COP26 last year, there were all these announcements that governments and multilateral institutions would no longer finance fossil fuels. And we were all very excited about that. But I've actually been on various closed-door meetings with different African countries, and they've been really frustrated about the fact that these commitments have been made Whereas there has not been an accompanying commitment to buy down the cost of capital for renewable energy in those yeah. countries. So they're being starved of capital to develop energy infrastructure while not yet being provided, although there are notable exceptions like the Global Energy Alliance, which has now just come out, um, which is philanthropists rather than governments, um, with, a, with a meaningful and affordable way to massively scale up renewables. So, I mean, I feel like if we're going to do the one, we've got to also do the other and provide a good on-ramp to that, which is to do with the cost of capital and it's to do with preparing the projects in those countries. So this is a big area that we'll probably need to unpack this year. Absolutely true. And I have also heard those voices. In fact, I've heard those voices even from UN staff mm. who are saying, no, 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 no. You know, for Africa, we have to put a, a, a protective um, boundary around Africa and Africa should be able to invest or attract investment into gas as much as they like um, because the cost of capital for renewables is still in Africa is still too high. And so that's where that argument of will then buy down the risk yeah. is absolutely critical and a very important role for either big philanthropic funding or for development um, institutions to do that. And can I just throw in the idea that the, the governments, you know, in the EU, for example, UK, whatever, should be looking holistically, uh, particularly you mentioned this Ukrainian crisis, um, you know, nobody really wants to be dependent upon another country um, for their energy. So there are uh, 
uh, what you could call national security imperatives alongside climate change imperatives. But whoever's developing low cost renewable or, you know, zero carbon energy infrastructure can sell into those markets as well and sort their own country out. Now, now, because what Paul said is slightly controversial, I'd just like to point out that it was Paul, not Tom, who just said that. So, listeners, they were occasionally confused, but just, you know, making Very proud, sure. very <laughs> proud to be associated with his opinions. Right. Anything else to add before we turn to our very exciting interview for this week? This is a cracking interview. You're going to love it. I think we're good for I, now. That's a good That's a good crop for today. All right, all right. So, Adam McKay. Speaking of controversial... Yeah. that's a good description of this unbelievable movie that we're going to talk about. Ah, uh, yes. Unbelievable movie. So I am sure that many people have seen Don't Look Up, the one of the best viewed films on Netflix ever. Uh, came from director Adam McKay, BAFTA award-winning writer, director, and producer, celebrated for works like The Big Short and Vice. Don't Look Up is, of course, a satirical movie about climate change released just before Christmas and quickly became the second most watched Netflix movie in history with over 320 million total hours streamed. He is a brilliant person. Um, we, we spoke to him just a couple of days ago and we're just kind of blown away by how thoughtful, how creative, how full of energy he is. You're going to really enjoy this interview and we'll be back afterwards with a but, bit more discussion. But, but spoiler alert. There, there are spoilers for the film in the interview. So if you've not watched the film, just go and hold with the podcast now. Go and watch Don't Walk, Look Up and then come back and enjoy the interview. But you may have uh, some, some things revealed to you in this interview uh, that, will, that will diminish your joy at the film. So there's the spoiler alert. Very nice. All right. Here's Adam. Well, Adam, um, truly, what a what a pleasure and what an honor to have you on Outrage and Optimism. We were just saying before we started recording that you must be the most popular person to have interviews with now um, after the unbelievable success of Don't Look Up. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for taking mm. uh, some time to join us here on this podcast our uh, listeners will be really truly very excited well thank um, you for having me i appreciate it adam i wanted to take you first back to the origin of the idea of the movie because rumor or reports have it that you were quite taken by the report that came out from the IPCC in 2018, I just wanted to invite you as a non-climate uh, nerd, because the rest of us here we are, are we climate are. nerds. <laughs> but we're happy to welcome you as a new climate nerd. Yes, happy yeah. to welcome <laughs> yeah. you. You're in the club. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> I, I just wanted to invite you to share with us the impact of that report on you, because I'm sure you, you, you came at it from a different perspective than we did, but you reached somewhat similar conclusions. How was that for you? Yeah, well, you know, I've been aware of uh, the climate crisis for quite some time. You know, like a lot of people, I saw Al Gore's documentary, which was a wake up for me. Um, and I started realizing, oh, we're, you know, we're looking at something that's going to be very dangerous in, you know, I, I always, anytime I hear certain statistics, I always realize they've probably been filtered through a lot of political mechanisms and systems. So when I heard Al Gore in An Inconvenient Truth ring the alarm bell, you know, there was talk of it being 80 years away, 100 years away. And I sort of filtered that to, oh, it's probably 50 years away. But with that IPCC report, what became glaringly apparent, and I'm sure a lot of your listeners know, the IPCC report is very conservative. There are dozens and dozens of countries that have to approve those scientific findings. So it gets filtered and filtered and filtered. Mm. So for that report to be that alarmist and that mm. concerned really shook me. 
Yeah. And I had two, three nights where I couldn't sleep mm. as I started, to, as, as the whole picture started to come into focus. Mm. And because of that report, I started reading a lot of other books, talking to a lot of other people. Mm. David Wallace Wells is a friend. I read his book, Uninhabitable Earth, mm. which added to my uh, poor sleeping habits. <laughs> and <laughs> It's kind no of in doubt. the title, Adam. It's we, in the title. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm sure that came as no surprise. Uh, and then, you know, social media is, for the most part, a, a, a destructive hellscape. But one of the <laughs> great, great things on social media is you can talk to a lot of renowned climate scientists. And I've gotten to know them through the years. So I reached out to a bunch of them and started asking questions. And the answers I got were far from comforting. So from that point on, my whole worldview shifted and I felt an urgency in my bones. And I started looking at the world around us in a very, very different way. And as, as, a, as a small anecdote, I said to my wife back then, who, who was, had, had about enough of me with all of this, and I said, you know, we should get uh, air filters because those hills uh, over to the north of us are going to catch fire. And she just said, well, whatever, whatever. And so I bought these big air filters. I bought about five of them. <laughs> This is about a year or two after that report. Oh, no. <laughs> and they showed up right as the pandemic hit and right as we had massive fires in Pasadena. Oh, where you wow. Where you couldn't go in your backyard because the air quality index was so horrific. And that was the first time my wife looked at me like, Oh, he may know something here. So, did, so did she uh, bow down very deeply in respect? She uh, she did not. She gave me one half second glance uh, that just said maybe he's not a total lunatic. Um, yeah, that you're was never it. a prophet in your own land, Adam. That's right. that, that was the full extent of the recognition. That's knocking the ball out the park, <laughs> right? And then uh, so. Ever since then, I've been operating under the assumption uh, that this is coming. And then the most recent piece of information I heard was a climate, uh, a piece of climate modeling from a group called Climate Analytics that said mm -hmm. that in uh, by the year 2030, half of our days will be once every hundred year uh, heat events. Wow. And I read that, that was about two weeks ago and I can't shut up about it. And everyone I talk to in the media, I just say, why are you not reporting on that? I mean, that is massive, massive news. Um, so yeah, it's been quite the journey. It's not been pleasant, but at the same time, I'll always choose being awake over being asleep. Hmm. Um, and the good news is it led to this movie. Uh, I felt after I had this awakening that it, it just, I, I don't know if I can ever do anything ever again that isn't at least related to the biggest story, empirically speaking, the biggest story in human history. Um, the only one that's even a close second uh, is, is the possibility of nuclear war. And then the third after that is a distant third. So, um, so yeah, this is the biggest story in human history. It's the greatest threat to life in 66 million years. And uh, I feel a little bit like I I'm living in a crazy house, a crazy world, because I turn on the news and they don't talk about it. You see our leaders and you can tell they don't really feel the reality in their bones of what we're facing. Um, and so it it's, it's really changed my life. Mm. Mm. Well, just hearing you say that, I can already see the uh, the script of the movie being written in your conscious or in your unconscious. Well, I have several projects that are coming up. We're doing an anthology series for HBO that's sort of like uh, Black Mirror, but it's all climate related. Uh, I'm working on my next movie, which will at least it will be uh, climate related. 
uh, or even just directly about climate. I have two ideas I'm looking at. So <laughs> yeah, this is the this is the this Ooh. is the mission. I mean, how do we break through that wall of white noise and distraction and news and chatter that's, you know, in many cases funded by the fossil fuel industry through advertising? So well, that's kind of that's kind of my personal mission no, no, that no, I've no. taken on. Yeah. We totally get that. I mean, I'm, I can't actually imagine what the Black Mirror of climate change is going to be like. I find Black Mirror very brilliant, but difficult to watch. But honestly, I mean, uh, Adam, I, th I think that um, the role of comedians, even in very serious topics, you know, I found, for example, the presidency of Donald Trump very difficult. It was comedians and, of course, great script writers uh, who, who, who got me and I think millions, billions of people through that experience um, is, is a very important thing. Um, but I mean, this this is a real breakthrough film that you've made. Uh, it's a kind of new genre, almost. Uh, you know, a kind of new category. It's ambitious, but it it tries to deal with the totality of it. And I've read these amazing statistics of like three hundred, more than three hundred million hours of viewing. I was trying to work out how is this like the Squid Game of human survival or the Big Short of the Earth or whatever. But can I can I ask you what what you've learned from your experience of of writing this film and 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 producing a, just a hugely successful mass communication on climate change? Well, the most heartening, wonderful thing that we got to experience with this movie is that, you know, you make these movies and you kind of hope that people will relate to the story you're telling. And, but you never really know, you know, I mean, you do some test screenings for audiences to make sure you're not a total lunatic. Um, and so, you know, you're in the ballpark, um, but until it was released on Netflix and it happens with the flick of a switch, suddenly the movie goes across the world to, I think there, there are uh, 540 million people they have access to Amazing. through Netflix, which is a 14th of the planet, which is hard to comprehend. And the second they flicked that switch and it went live, it was the most incredible, borderline, beautiful thing because what you saw, what, and usually this doesn't happen with comedies. Comedies don't cra cross cultural and, and national lines, but the movie was number one in 87 different countries. It was number one in Nigeria. It was number one in Pakistan, Brazil, Peru, Jeez. Argentina, Cambodia, uh, Canada, the US, France, like on and on. I'm, you know, 87 different countries. And what I realized at that moment is, you know, we, we like to think that most people are living under a rock or don't care, but it's the exact opposite. And what you saw were all these people were feeling what we were feeling, the team of people that made this movie. And, and they were feeling that, you know, we're not being told the truth. Our leaders aren't taking it seriously. And by the way, that could even flow out of climate into income inequality, corruption, yeah. uh, yes. you know, uh, ego, greed narcissism and and to see i think by estimates right now 300 million people have seen this movie and to see you can look on social media in actual time to see all their responses come through and to see, and to see these responses that were like yes this is it this is what i've been feeling um oh my god i cried at the ending oh my god i laughed so hard this is our world and it was really a wonderful thing and just a reminder that no, 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 people get it. They do in their in their in their muscles, in their soul, they know the truth. Mm. And it was incredible. It was really a wonderful thing. Mm. I, Adam, I love the movie. I should come straight out and say I've seen it three times and I picked up different things each time I saw it. I particularly enjoyed at the very end in the sort of comedy scene. And I didn't pick this up the first two times that everyone who comes out of the cryo freezing chambers is like an lobbyist or an oil person or something. <laughs> and it's so good that you stick these little things in there. But I, I have a few questions I want to ask you in very quick order. The first is I loved it. Everyone I know loved it in the climate space and felt very seen. But the critics didn't love it. Why do you think that there was such a clear division between critics not loving it and people who work on this issue and the general public being so enthused? 
Well, in, in fairness, the critics were almost perfectly 50-50 right. divided. So there were critics that loved it. There okay. were critics that got it. But here's the part where you're correct. The critics who didn't like it hated it in a way that I have never <laughs> experienced. And I have done this for almost 30 years, and I have never read reviews like this. It's the hallmark of good amazing. art, Adam, is, is yeah. when I, people are totally divided. I mean, they were angry. They went after me personally. They were dismissive. They were, and I, at first I was very confused because, you know, we had screened the movie for audiences beforehand and we had never gotten that reaction ever. Now once, and by the way, they're test screenings. I'm not saying they're definitive. And of course, every critic should, they have a professional responsibility to have the reaction they have. So respect, you know, I respect their reactions. They should have those reactions, but it was very interesting. And what I started realizing, it wasn't just the critics. There were a lot of members of the media too, that had this reaction of, being kind of like, they, they kept saying, I felt like the movie was yelling at me. And I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and, and because for audiences, they felt like the movie was on their side. Right. They felt like they were the scientists. They felt like they were the ones living in a crazy world. So it was very interesting to see some of the critics say, I felt like the movie was yelling at me. And it was like, oh, I, it never occurred to me, but of course the movie is vicious to the media. And, and there is an, a, you know, a portion of the critics, once again, not all of the critics, but some of them, I think were watching the movie through the lens of the media. And, and, and it never occurred to me that anyone would watch the movie like that. Now, by the way, there are other critics who just didn't think it was funny, who didn't like the filmmaking, and that's all valid. You can have those reactions. But the the intensity of those reactions from some of those critics was really interesting. And then there was, you know, some of the critics, too, would write for outlets. There was the critic from the Wall Street Journal, which is a well-known climate-denying newspaper. Mm. And... And it was very funny to read his review because it's just like, dude, have like one step of awareness. Like <laughs> you're walking into this building that literally your day in, day out job is to, you know, fuel the climate catastrophe. And you watch this movie and oh, surprise, surprise, you didn't dig it. So, um, but it was really interesting. And, and man, oh man, I'll take passionate hatred over, you know, Blase dismissal any day of the week. It clearly touched nerves it touched with a enough. lot of people, and and I, it, it really reminded me of the power of film that you can get that kind of unabashed love. You can have climate scientists saying, "I finally feel seen." Epidemiologists, I finally feel heard. You can have regular people going, "Oh my God, this is how I see the world." But then you can have an element of uh, of the professional media saying, "This is garbage." I hate this like good yeah by the end of it i was like good let it fly yeah so so i i, I totally agree and it and absolutely triggered debate I'm, I'm sure you've seen this data there's some polling that came out from it was quite big a, a few thousand responses and it basically showed that progressives having seen the film this is us only and how it translated to support for urgent federal action on climate progressives moved modestly from an already high base towards more support independence became very significantly more supportive of urgent action on climate. Ooh. And Republicans had a massive backlash and a drop of 15% in terms of support for, for urgent action on climate. So again, that sort of demonstrates what you just described, how this absolutely, it held this mirror up to society and people either had an emotive reaction where they reacted against it or they then went for further support. I'd love to know your reaction to that data and what that means for our strategy going forward. Is there, is there any way to reach that or are we, do we have to focus on the movable middle who will have a sort of rational response to these things? So, so you guys know this better than I do. There, there's some really positive polling as far as the amount of people that deny the climate crisis has gone down quite a mm, bit. Yeah. And they're no longer really a statistical significant part of the discussion. And so really for, for us, what the, the people that this movie was really pointed towards were the people that in the polling say they're somewhat concerned. Mm. And by the way, that's a lot of my friends 
Clintons, that's a lot of the people where I live in Los Angeles tend to think of the climate as an issue, as Mm. one of a bunch Mm. of issues. Now, they're smart people, so they know it's real. They're not denying the science, but they somehow stopped in their awareness uh, uh, of it at the, oh my God, our poor great grandkids. And that's the portion of the population that's really, uh, and I say this respectfully, but really doing the most damage. Mm. Because if you really understand what this climate crisis is, and I'm a goofball, I'm not a scientist. I just happen to stumble into this information. So it's not like I'm any better than anyone else. I just, I got lucky or unlucky if you're my wife um, and, (laughs) and happen to stumble into it. But that somewhat concerned block, they're the ones who are stopping action. Right. They're the ones, because if you know what's going on, you are not somewhat concerned. Mm. You are fully freaked out on full alert. And I've tried to explain this to people, but you know, when you're telling people stuff, that's just a person saying it. So, you know, all we can do is batter our media to start covering this as a daily story, which is what it is. It's not a once a week story and we got to hope they can start breaking through. So, so I'm not surprised by those reactions. The other thing I can tell you is there's been a lot of anecdotal responses from people who identify as conservatives loving the movie. There was actually a great analysis of the movie in the American conservative. There were several Mm. positive reviews from conservative outlets because of the the faith element in the movie. There's a prayer in the end, spoiler alert. There's a lot of religious right people that really love the movie. And when we did our testing for the screenings, because we had people identify their political leanings, we found once we swung the movie to more of a comedy, it it actually brought along a significant amount of self-identifying conservatives. So Hmm. it's not quite as dire as those numbers show. And you guys know polling is tricky, how people identify as tricky. There are all kinds of right-wingers. There are the extreme right-wingers. There are the fiscally conservative right-wingers. There are the religious right-wingers. And I had family members who are right-wingers call me on this movie saying how much they loved it, whereas my last couple movies, they just never even call me. So it's... um, I'm definitely seeing some positive signs. And I'm a big believer that there is a common language that can be spoken uh, that we're just not not doing uh, that's alienating and dividing us. Mm. And I think this movie uh, achieves some of that, which I, I did not expect. But uh, having seen it, it, it's it's quite hopeful. Mm. You know, Adam, um, I am luckily not in your shoes to have to put something like this together. Um, and if I were in your shoes, I would. the toughest thing for me would be to choose which aspects of climate change to bring into the movie and which ones to leave on the wayside because climate is such a complex issue and has so many different facets and so many different factors and so many different dimensions that it would be frankly completely impossible to make a movie that covers everything. But I have to tell you, to be frank, one of the pieces that you, I believe, chose to simplify out and that stayed sort of in my attention pocket the whole time and I'm really wondering why did you choose to take it out or to to not bring it in, rather, not to take it out, but to not bring it in, is the fact that climate is created by us humans. It is not a threat to mankind that is nature created. It's human created. And so that, to me, puts a different spin on this whole thing because if we cause the problem, then it gives us a deeper sense of responsibility to address the problem. So I wondered, how how did you make an incredibly difficult choice about which aspects of climate to bring in and which ones to leave for your next movie, perhaps? (laughs) Well, so the entire goal of this movie, because you guys know 
uh, better than I do, that the trick with climate is, you know, that it's to use Timothy Morton's expression, the eco philosopher, a hyper object, that it's something that's so massive, so sprawling, that in some ways it, it defies our cognitive abilities as humans and is very difficult to grasp, which is what we're seeing in play now. So the, the simple trick that we did in the movie is we eliminated that. We we took out climate change and made it a simple, giant, dirty rock, a comet that's going to hit Earth on a very direct schedule. So we got rid of the time haziness. We got rid of the sprawl, the science, like everyone can understand a comet because the point of this movie was the reaction. It's about us as humans, that hyper object. And it's about our economy. It's about our personalities, our limitations, our quest for power, for money, for distraction. That's what we were really trying to put the spotlight on in this movie. And the only way to do that was to simplify the climate crisis part of it. Um, so it, the comet was never meant to be a perfect stand-in for uh, climate. Uh, if anything, it was supposed to simplify so we could look at our reaction. And the reason we did that mm. is because the truth is we could have dealt with the climate crisis. We've had many opportunities. We knew about it in 1965. They had the science for uh, 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 greenhouse gases warming the earth back in the late 19th century. We, we In the 70s, the oil companies started to work to solve it, and then they decided it was cheaper not to. So really, the story of climate in a lot of ways is we're the animals on this planet that are creating it we're the animals that have the abilities to solve this problem, and we're not. And to me, that is the most striking thing about the climate catastrophe mm. is why we're not. So that's what this movie is focusing on. So you're, you're right. I'll be doing other projects that will get a little bit more on the climate side. But as you guys know, we have renewable energy. It's cheaper mm. than fossil fuels. We just have yeah. to deploy it. We did it in World War II with building thousands of bombers every second on the turn of a dime. Why can't we do that with renewable energy? Why aren't we expanding on uh, emerging technologies uh, like carbon removal? Uh, not carbon capture, carbon removal, which there's some promising technology out there. Why aren't we limiting, uh, you know, certain meats and and uh, factory products? Why aren't we like mobilizing right this second? And that's what the movie's about. So no, the comet is is a very imperfect stand-in for uh, climate change, and and that was definitely intentional. That's a very thoughtful answer, Adam. Thank you very much. I shall sleep better tonight because I've been noodling <laughs> on that one since I saw the movie. So thank you very much for that answer. But now I have one more question um, that I'm hoping you can give me an equally thoughtful answer. As a woman, tell me why if the U.S. president was going to be as irresponsible and as corrupt <laughs> as she is, why did you have to cast her as a female? Well, that one's a little simpler. That is the best roles are the worst characters. The funnest roles <laughs> tend to be the biggest egotistical dirt bags. And I just, I wanted to have a woman in that position. And you know, the truth is, God bless women. I do actually think you're better than men, uh, but I don't think you're a hundred percent better than men. So there's plenty of creepy women, uh, but mostly it was like, hey, this is a really fun role. Let's give it to a great uh, woman actor. So, uh, you know, that, that was the main impetus for it. All these creepy bad people, but only one Meryl Streep, right? And by the way, that doesn't hurt either. It's Meryl Streep. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. she is so fantastic. <laughs> Adam, 
this has been such a pleasure to talk to you. We have so enjoyed it. We, I love the movie. Uh, I've, as I said, I've seen it many times. I, I love so many elements of it. I think it was such a thoughtful commentary. I think you have done what so many of us have tried to do over many years, which is to move the debate forward, to bring new people into it, to have energetic conversations about where we go next. I mean, you, what, I'm once- so glad you said that, Tom, because I thought when you said what so many of us have been trying to do for many years, I thought, please don't say that we've been trying to make a movie because that is totally <laughs> not true. No, no, no. We, should have been. we know we our limitations. Been. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have to comment. I mean, I was on a call with you with Catherine Hayhoe a little while ago, who has been a previous guest on this podcast, a brilliant climate scientist, evangelical Christian. And, and she just made such a beautiful comment to you. She said, you know, this film was amazing because it was about listening to science. But at the critical moment, you also brought in the role of faith. I mean, that's just one example of the thoughtfulness mm. that you brought to the narrative. And um, and we loved it. And, and thank you for that. And thank you for joining us today. We have one closing question for you, which we ask all of our guests. Um, we would love to know, now that you have made this film, you look to what's next for you, what's next for the world. Can you tell us one thing that you feel outraged by as you think about the climate crisis and one thing that you feel optimistic about? Yeah, I I feel I, I really, this movie uh, elucidated it even more for me as I talked about earlier. I'm outraged by the total failure of our news media to report on the biggest story in human history. I now really pay attention to it and it's shocking. It's shocking to turn on broadcast news and and to some degree a lot of the print journalism, although they do a little bit of a better job, and just to see how they push it as a sideline story. And that makes me want to scream. That makes me want to, and maybe there's some sort of program where we can have scientists go into newsrooms around the country, because I suspect these are not bad people. These are, I think they just don't fully know the scope and scale, because if they did, there's no way they wouldn't be covering it on a daily basis. It's also possible the fossil fuel average does create a conflict of interest that that definitely could be part <laughs> sure. of it and and it creates a culture so that is the most I, and then I would say a close second is like I get that our governments are overrun with dirty fossil fuel money but the easiest thing to do in the world no one would be bothered by this is to create Manhattan project style laboratories that just start putting five, 10, $20 billion into these and start working on cutting edge technologies for more affordable renewals, carbon removal. Like, why aren't we at least doing that? Like, that's just utterly harmless. It creates jobs. It's like everything about that is good. Those two things, I just can't get over. The silence from the media and the number two, why we're not even doing bare minimum stuff that's not even controversial. So anyway, those are the two <laughs> That, that can I can go on like a long rant, as you can tell, because I just went on a mini rant. <laughs> that, uh, is, that was the outrage comment. We want to hear about the optimism. And then Paul yes, has one more yes, question. Yes, I was going to get to the optimism. Okay. Here's <laughs> the optimism. The optimism is a good one. We have renewable energy. It's awesome. It works. I'm in a house right now with solar panels on my house. Now, granted, I'm an overpaid Hollywood guy, so I can afford it, <laughs> but it's getting more and more affordable. They have, you know, you can rent uh, renewable. You can call up and you don't even have to pay. They'll come and put it on your house and you pay like a monthly thing. Electric cars are getting more and more. And I know that building an electric car creates CO2, but still we got to move forward. So that is incredibly optimistic. People love it. There's a lot of countries in Europe that are way ahead of the curve on this, that are creating renewables. Um, so that is huge. It would be one thing to be facing this, this massive catastrophe and we don't know what to do. We have the answer. And that is a huge, shining, bright, optimistic light that gets me bounding out of bed every single day. Love it. Hmm. Adam, a last thing I can't resist if I may, just the very end of the film, I mean, you know, the whole film is about extraordinary juxtaposition, you know, the infinite perfection of nature cut in with the stupidity of so many people. And we are so kind of preoccupied by advertising messages and, and you've spoken eloquently about that. And yet, you know, in another sense, we really did have everything, didn't we? Can you speak a little bit about the ending of the film? Because it was so powerful. Yeah, I mean... 
where I, I think the inclusion of the nature images, which I had a little bit of that in the script, but my editor, Hank Corwin, really expanded on that and talked about how important that was. And that was the first time the movie started actually making me cry when I would watch it. Uh, some of the early cuts were those shots of just the miracle of these beautiful animals and of nature and of our oceans and whales and that perfect bumblebee and a mother hippo with their baby and, and, and the beautiful blue sky and the sun shining down and that baby in the wash basin, a brand new uh, baby. And, and man, I mean, just the miracle when you really think about it, the possibilities of life, a big deep inhale of clean air, uh, just the feeling of your body jumping in water, jumping into the ocean and seeing fish around you and all the food we have and beautiful fruits and, and our, you know, hugging your children. And I mean, we have more than everything. That, that, that line, all credit to Leonardo DiCaprio, he came up to me right before we were shooting that scene and he said, what if I said this line? He thought of it right before we were going to roll and it just, it hit me right in the chest and uh, I just said, yeah, do it. Um, and I think uh, that's, that really is the message of the movie. We, we, we have everything right now. And the idea that we're going to throw it away just because we're too busy or our schedule or our phone doesn't provide us with time to really, truly take five minutes and a big, deep breath to think about what's happening right now uh, is, yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking. But I also think in that sadness, in that grieving, there's a beauty to it, too. I think we tend to think of emotions as being one or the other, but you can have a lot of feelings at once. So I feel optimistic. I feel sad. I feel tremendous gratitude. Um, and at the same time, part of me still has to laugh at uh, how ridiculous it all is. <laughs> I love that uh, that fan of uh, of emotions that spans uh, so many so many different strings in our heart. Mm. Adam, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Well, for this conversation for sure, but thank you for putting your your genius, your time, your energy into making this movie. It, and I don't think we've uh, we have still seen the full impact of it. And um, this conversation makes me want to go and watch it again. So there you are. I love it. As should everyone listening. And yeah. for any one of our <laughs> listeners who haven't seen it, please, please, please do go. Um, and if you've seen it once, see it again. Or follow Tom Rivet Karnak. If you've seen it two times, see it three times. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having me. Oh, one bit of good news. I just read that Mar in March... The nation of France is going to do a just look up day where a, bu <laughs> a bunch of the different cities are going to have rallies uh, for uh, the environment and for uh, fighting against the climate catastrophe. So well, there it's, you go. It's that's, just the look up. <laughs> that's the best response. That's the best response to your movie. I love it. I'm delighted to be in France right now. Fantastic. Very clever country. Paris Agreement. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for having me. Love what you do. Thank you, Adam. Onward. Thanks, Adam. Thank you, Onward. Adam. Onward. Bye. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So what a pleasure to get to sit down and talk with Adam McKay just a few weeks after this, I think, I mean, to me, game-changing music, Kate. Game after this game changing <laughs> movie came out, what did you both leave that conversation with? Paul, you always you always go next. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I I think uh, it's absolutely delightful, human, um, and uh, it made a film that's very very important. Probably one of the most enormous climate change interventions. Three hundred and twenty two million hours of people watching it. Um, I notice that he's you know, he's concerned that we're basically not paying attention to this absolutely giant problem. And of course he's right. Um, you know, we were talking before the uh, interview about, you know, gas prices and society being torn apart and all the rest of it. You know, we need to have a debate. Um, you know, we're being threatened, right? 
uh, humanity is being threatened and we need to have a debate. The government needs to run a debate because the film was really about government in action. We need the government to, to instigate a debate with the people about what we're going to do. You know, we've got a right to be protected by our, our defence ministries. We've got a right to health through our health ministries. We've got a right to education through our education ministries. And we've got a right not to be destroyed by climate change. And just because we haven't institutionalized that to the level we have with defense, health and education, it doesn't mean that we can't have a, a, a society-wide debate now to just get this done. And that's the point he's making. And I think he's a genius for doing it, not only in, in a way that, that's very touching, but also one that's, that's very effective. And I particularly liked him talking about the way you can have all these different emotions at the same time. When he said, I feel optimistic, I feel sad, I feel tremendous gratitude all at the same time and part of me thinks how ridiculous it all is. That is really nailing a very complicated construct. Hmm. I must say I was very grateful for his um, clear answer to my question about how did he make his choices about simplifying climate change? Because I have to tell you, and well, I had told you a long time ago, I've been sitting with that and finding myself getting, you know, not just mystified that I didn't have an answer, but actually even getting like upset about the fact that, wait, 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 climate change is not as simple as simply this big, huge rock that is going to hit um, the earth out of no responsibility of our own. And so I've been sitting with that for such a long time. So I'm really glad that I got to ask him that question, but I'm more grateful for his answer, which was, this is not, his intent was not about portraying climate change for what it is, for the, with all its complexities, with all its ramifications. He's actually, from his lens, he is much more focused on our human reaction to a threat of that consequence. That's what he's really focusing yeah. on. So he's focusing, you know, not on the science, on the, on the, um, interestingly enough, although scientists play such a big role, but he's not really portraying the science of climate change, is he? He's actually, his main focus is how do we react to what science tells us? How do we react to what uh, big corporations tell us? Mm. How do we react to what irresponsible governments say, say or do or don't say or don't do? And so that, I was really grateful for that answer because uh, to be totally honest, it completely changed my perspective on the movie. And I'm like, okay, from that perspective, I'm with you. Yeah, I, I agree. And I mean, there are other ways. There's, I don't know if you read uh, the newsletter Heated that Emily Atkin puts out. It's brilliant if you don't read it. It's all sorts of news on climate, very opinionated, very interesting. And she did a whole thing about how would how would the analogy have been more accurate on climate. And she pointed out that what it should have been would have been a meteor hitting the global south and having a much bigger impact on the global south and on the global north. And then the global north decides it doesn't really care because it's not affecting them, which is also quite analogous on very sadly of what's happening on climate. But at the yep. end of the day, it's about demonstrating that we need to listen to science. There's a major risk coming our way and we're behaving like idiots by ignoring it. And I didn't, mm. I, didn't I, I thought it was, as I said, <laughs> not in not in on the fence on this i thought it was a really really good movie i enjoyed it i thought that the acting was good i thought it was cleverly constructed with the narrative and the subplots and god bless him for doing it and putting his head out and saying yes. on our podcast i can never make a movie about something that's not like this anymore you know this is now the thing that i'm going to do and i'm going to try and use my platform to accelerate this and really i would applaud anybody who does that so 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 really impressed with him and and we need more adam mckay steven spielberg if you're listening all these other different people. Calling Steven Spielberg. Calling Steven Spielberg. We need a saving no. private Ryan of humanity. No, and that is so true because how long have we been saying, look, the science, you know, we, we, we have more science uh, cascading over us than we can possibly digest. And that doesn't really make a difference in policy decisions. Mm. And, um, and, and, and we know that we've known that for such a long time. And so to have other avenues to get to us, um, us being the collective consciousness of uh, so many millions of people now yeah. that have seen this and are really beginning to noodle on this. You know, 
very likely a 0.0001% of those millions of people who have seen this would ever sit down and write and, and read an IPCC report. Right. And <laughs> or listen to so, Outrage and Optimism. Or listen to Outrage and Optimism. Although they should. So, you know, God bless. God bless him for using uh, the screen to to bring this message and to to bring it, so to speak, to the kitchen table. And, and just two more quick things to add on that. One is fair play Netflix. You know, he was shopping this script around Hollywood and struggling to get uptake on it is what he said. Ah. I can't remember on this call in the previous one. Netflix went for it. Look at the cast they assembled, the amount of money they put into this. Kudos their, to Netflix. Emma Kudos Stewart, to Netflix. friend of ours there who runs sustainability. Christiana and I are on the advisory board there. Not that we had anything to do with the decision to take this, um, but that was a big a big step that they did that and their big yes. Christmas release. So kudos to Netflix. And also, we haven't mentioned on this podcast, the accompanying website called Count Us In, which is something that we've also been involved in, which has been mm. constructed specifically as a place to go after you've watched Don't Look Up to take a range of individual actions and collective actions that can turn the momentum that comes out of watching the film into real change on the ground. So again, kudos to them for constructing it. And if anybody hasn't checked that out, if you've watched the film or if you haven't, take a look at Countersin. All the things you can do and at the top of them all, vote. Vote. Right. Um, I realize we're rapidly running out of time and we've blown through our targets that we set ourselves just not very long ago. So <laughs> as ever, loving the music. Last week was a beautiful piece of music and this week the same. We have Sibyl Sila Arba with the song Angina Luta. Hope you enjoy it. It's a beautiful piece of music and we will see you as ever next week. Thanks for joining us. And next week we will have none other than Yuval Noah Harari with us. Yay! We'll see you then. All right. Bye. Bye for now. Bye. Yeah, um, my name is Sibusile Kaba. I uh, stay in KwaZulu in South Africa. Yeah, this song is called Angina Luto, which means I, I have nothing. Uh, the idea behind the song is to acknowledge that we have nothing without nature, without the creator without indigenous systems from people who came before us. So this one is just a dedication to say that let's not forget, for if we forget, we will have nothing. We'll kill our earth and everything that's in it. We will have nothing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah,
There it is, another episode of Outrage and Optimism. I'm Clay, producer of the show. Thank you for listening. That was Sibusile Abba with Angino Luto. We love having music on the podcast, and this is a perfect example why. Sibusile Abba is a prolific artist, so there's much more music waiting for you just around the corner. So check the show notes for that. It's all there. So welcome to the end of the show. Uh, This is the part of the podcast where I wrap up with a thank you or two, highlight some extended listening or viewing for our listeners to check out. And I've got a few things this week, so let's get into it. Uh, Late last year around COP26, we played a soundscape on the podcast called Positive Imaginings by Rowan Bank, which is an environmental arts and education group based in Edinburgh. Now, they create opportunities and, in our opinion, brilliantly, they do so, uh, for young people who encounter barriers to participating in climate action, you know, and help them get involved, uh, feel inspired and empowered. And they recently created a couple short films documenting their creative process, um, documenting the implementation, uh, the playful nature of how to confront climate anxiety with children and empower them through education to inspire action. Um, And I can't say enough good things about them. You need to go check out these short films. I've got a link in the show notes to those. I also just a few minutes ago received an email from Lucy, who is one of the founders of Rowan Bank, if we, uh, the Outrage and Optimism community, have any ideas regarding sponsorship for the Positive Imaginings Project. So I'm just throwing this out there to everybody. Go watch the short films, read a bit more about them, and send them a message. Start the conversation. I think there's an exciting opportunity there. What a cool project. Uh, Next, Tom mentioned in the show both the Emily Atkin heated article, I second reading that article, and going to don'tlookup.count-us-in.com. I had a friend text me saying she felt helpless and unsure of what to do after watching Don't Look Up. And as I'm sure this movie might be a waking up to the catastrophe unfolding for many of your friends, Count Us In is a fantastic way to partner on an action or two together post watching the film and you know intentionally begin co-creating a better world. Thank you to Adam McKay for joining us on the podcast. Don't Look Up is streaming on Netflix right now. It's probably on your front page, like right at the top when you log in, because it just got nominated for four Academy Awards. So congratulations to Adam and the team. Last recommendation from me, if you are like Tom and you are on your third or fourth watch of Don't Look Up and you can't get enough, 
Netflix made a behind the scenes podcast in partnership with Hyper Object, which is Adam's production company, and Pineapple Street Media, which if you know, you know. The podcast is sensational. The first episode will hook you in. It's a great weekend listen. Six episodes waiting for you right now. It's called The Last Movie Ever Made, the Don't Look Up podcast. You can find it on your podcast player. Now, if you love this podcast, please consider leaving us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts and writing us a review. It makes a world of a difference for getting the word out on the show, and we'd love to hear what you have to say. You can find us on social media at globaloptimism.com. Would love to see you there as well. And hey, next week, Yuval Noah Harari makes a return to the show. Now, his episode from the last time we had him on was one of our most listened to episodes. He's back next week for another. Okay, that is the end. I hope the end of this podcast finds you well. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we'll see you next week. Thank you.